In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondicast. Welcome to the Vundacast, the official podcast of Vundablog.com, the home of whatever, the podcast that fills your ears with the nerdy nutrients that make them strong. I am your host, the man with the plan, the man with the editing software, the man who's holding the microphone, Steven, and with me today, the curly queen of the Vundacast, the one and only... Danielle, how you doing, Danielle? I'm good. I'm eating Reese's Pieces. Reese's Pieces. This we're so you're. This is like an episode of uh, not an episode, but this is like ET. Only your ET in this in, in this situation. <laughs> Today's whatever is gonna be a little talk about the Netflix original series Daredevil, based on the Marvel comic of the same name, obviously. But before we get all up into that, let's talk about recent events for the Vunda Blog and Vundacast. We were representing at at uh, Miami Huracan on April fourth. Yes. We had a table at the center of the convention. Yes. We were sitting there with our awesome Don Two stand up poster thing, and he was proclaiming that Don loves Vundablog dot com, and it was true because he does. At least the poster I own does. Yes. And uh, we had mystery bags for sale with all sorts of cool stuff. We could not get rid of our Don 2 um, stand. We tried very hard because we don't know what else to do with it. It worked out really well for the table, but the other it 364 just takes days of the year is sitting in a garage. So, yeah. But no one wanted it, not even for $3. We, we had gotten it when we actually... We went to go see Dawn 2 at uh, Sunset Place, and we had gone to see it on a whim because we were like, it's an Indian action movie, it looks interesting, we never get to see these things, let's check it out. And we loved the movie so much and laughed and were so into the movie that on the way out we asked the management if they were going to do anything with the giant standy poster, and they were like, you really want that? And we were like, yes we do, and yes, we walked we out with it proudly. We're waiting for our moment, maybe we should sell it on like eBay India or something. For sure. That's the way to go. Yeah. eBay India. And then we'll see that Shah Rukh Khan's going to be the guy that buys it. I like pictures of myself. It makes me look good. Um, so we were at Miami Huracan. We also had some movie mixtapes that we gave out to some lucky fans. And uh, Mr. J, Mrs. J, Danielle and I were, you know, saying what's up to people, spreading the good word of the blog and podcast. And so far, fun. it's been, you know, quite a success. No complaints. But if you have comments or suggestions or anything. Complaints. You can always. No, we don't want complaints. We don't want complaints? All right. Complaints store is closed. But if you, if you feel like contacting us, tweet us at Vundablog or at Vundacast on Twitter. Or email us Vundablog at gmail.com or Vundacast at gmail.com. Yes. Also, in recent events, on a previous podcast, we interviewed people at Shock Pop Comic Con, and we inter and we did a review of Shock Pop Comic Con, attached to the blog post with this uh, podcast. You'll find a link to an article about Shock Pop Comic Con and about John Waters and how he got stiffed on half of his payment. Uh, a lot of people payment. got stiffed more than just John Waters. We really hope that the people that we interviewed. Um, which Lisa Hammer, Lisa Hammer and Avril and Rodriguez Av really didn't get stiffed and I hope that they got their 
I hope they got what they needed from the con because it's very unfortunate. They were very nice people, and, you know, you could tell a lot of people were there for the love. Like, John Waters' fee is only, like, $6,000. No, no, that that was half of his fee. That was half of his fee? Yeah, he got got the half up front and half afterwards, I think. That's what the article said. No, it said he got $3,000. Oh, so his his whole fee was, like, $10,000? I think his whole fee is, like, $6,000. Which is not bad for a day's work. No, it's not. pretty fair, and he's a legend. Exactly. But... So you gotta that's what I'm saying. pay I'm the man say- what he's owed. No, I, exactly. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying it's not right that like that. That's not enough. You know, for an, or an event like this, that's not a lot of money. I'm sure some of those big A-list stars that come in, you know what I mean, get more, get twice that much. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, I think it's messed up what happened. Um, it was very unfortunate because uh, the con, the con event organizer's mother was like standing by the door when we left, like asking us if we enjoyed the con and it's you know they seemed so like legit but obviously not you know not legit enough to take the hit and sign the checks when they matter exactly um but you know that's just a scandal we just want to keep you up to date on it because you know we reported on it and waved their flag around a little bit so yeah but unfortunately everyone to know yeah, well, unfortunately, they disappointed us. We, you know, we waved the flag to the people we interviewed. They had a really, they were really nice. Um, we waved the flag to the nice guys that uh, who gave us our tickets. The Pow Wow Show. The Pow Wow Show. Yeah. Who we won our tickets from. They were Pow Wow cool. Show podcast. They were cool and chill, and they gave us free tickets to go. Um, so we wave our flags to them. But you know, honestly, Shock Pop, very disappointed. Very unfortunate that you chose to go this route. I know you're going to get sued. I've already seen the article saying some people are already in the process, and it's what you deserve. I mean, you can't... I think a lot of people don't realize. They really don't, you know. There, Some people always go, why aren't there more cons? Why aren't there more cons? It's like doing something like this is a labor of love. It's, it's event organizing risk. to the 10th degree, and it's a big risk. It requires a lot of capital up front. Which is why, you know, it's smart. Like, for instance, Huracan is organized by UM, right? They're smart. They're anime club. They're anime club. They do a very... They've had... This is their third year, fourth. right? This fourth year. Wow. This is their fourth year. They're very successful. They're very... They keep They keep it small. They're smart about it. They don't try... They had one... Um, guest for the guest first time this year. Media guest for the first time this year. And it was an anime voice actor. Um... And they really know how to keep it under the bell. They organize things properly. Obviously, they're working with a budget. You know, this is my, this might even be coming off from, like, donations and fundraisers that they have and stuff like that. Maybe, like, a small budget that they get from UM for event organizing. Well, we have to pay a little bit for the table. Yes. So they collect that way, but... But, I mean, but still, the table it's not, price... It's not free. Yeah, the table... And especially since the table price is so affordable, and if you're a UM student, you get an even bigger discount. You get, like, a... What, it was like a huge discount. It was like yeah, uh, for a non UM student, it was seventy five. For a UM student, it was twenty five. I mean, that's that's amazing to me, and I think that they do a really excellent job. And you can tell they're building their con up little by little, and obviously all the successful cons that are still around in South Florida have built themselves up little by little. They're still not that big, because building a con requires people walking in the doors and being interested, and building a con requires money. And it requires organiz- organ- the most amazing organizational skills, which is why, you know, a lot of cons, they can be good cons, but they may not be the most organ. Like, it's it's a tough gig. It's a tough gig. It's worth it, but it's a tough gig. And we've all heard about, like, unsuccessful cons. Like, there was that uh, Tumblr con, Dash con fiasco. Oh, that was hilarious, yeah. That was so funny. The ball um, pit. If you thing. don't know anything about this, um, there are a few huge fandoms on Tumblr, which are Supernatural, Doctor Who... Um, Disney and a couple other ones I can't remember um, and they decided to plan a con and the there was an article written about basically the history of it and it just from the beginning it was it seemed like a good idea and then it quickly turned into um, a very large scale fiasco uh, first of all Tumblr wanted to have nothing to do with it they wanted to call it Tumblr con but Tumblr was who are, who is now owned by Yahoo were like, we want nothing to do with this, so they renamed it DashCon, which, you know, as you know, Tumblr has a dashboard where you can see all your posts, and then the organization just fell apart, people couldn't get their crap together, um, there were a lot of posts, uh, obviously, on Tumblr, because people on nothing people on Tumblr love more than to post about shit, and 
they posted about all the crap that went down and then what ended up happening is as the con went on it, it actually managed somehow to actually start. get a venue and start uh, at some point during the con they were kicked out of the venue because they had not paid the full fee for the for the time allotted and they had to fundraise with like a thousand people sitting in a hotel lobby Mm -hmm. They had to fundraise to get the money to open up back the venue. And they somehow managed to get the money from these people. But they all just sat there until they could scrimp up enough money. But the best part... <laughs> was the... Oh, the ball pit? <laughs> oh, yeah. The best part was... Uh, there was... You should, if you ever want to Google, Google Dashcon ball pit. Because they said there was going to be a ball pit. And if you donated or did something you got, like, time in the ball pit. And so, of course, everyone is imagining this big Discovery Zone, if you're in Miami, I Discovery Zone-style ball pit, like, fun thing. It was a kiddie pool filled with plastic balls. And... One. One. No, it was, no, it was filled with plastic balls. A single balls. kiddie pool. A single oh, a single pool. kiddie pool, yes. Oh, I thought you meant, like, a single ball No, pit. one <laughs> single ball, no. It's not ball pit. <laughs> it was a balls pit. They don't call it a balls pit. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> Thing. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. But anyway, so it's it was a single kiddie pool cut with plastic balls in it. That's the best part of the story. But Google Dash Con if you ever want to laugh because it's just it's it's just it's hard doing cons, man. You know, and I, the guy who did Shock Pop apparently all the collateral he got was from his rich family. So according to the article, according yeah. to the article, was all the money he got were from his parents, uh, relatives with money. And I guess even they didn't have enough capital to. They so either got fulfill greedy. his dreams. Yeah, they either got greedy and said screw it, or they realized that this was gonna make them broke, and they just said never mind. But um, if you are got screwed over by Shock Pop, I'm really sorry. I hope that doesn't. I hope if you've never been to South Florida before, it doesn't sour you to South Florida. Um, doesn't sour you to doing cons down here. Yeah, come back, Danny Trejo, come back. Please, I'm so sorry, Danny Trejo. I really hope... He must have gotten paid up front. There's no way then. Well, what the article said was... I don't know if he got paid up front or not. Uh-huh. Um, I think he got some of it up front for sure. Good. But what he got screwed on was transportation to and from the con. They were supposed to provide him a limo. Oh, and they didn't pay and his ma And they told his manager, like, oh, you pay for it and we'll pay you back after. And they never. Ever and it's not paid just the back. it's not just the media guests that got screwed over. It was um, the co the cosplayers too. You know the shock the cosplay competition. The shock pop Comic Con. They were touting that they were going to have the biggest cosplay contest payout. payout, and they never saw that money. They after a few days after the con, I remember seeing. Um, a post on the event page because they took down their because they took down their Facebook page. They disconnected all their phone and their numbers, Twitter, and all their information. And, and they um, and they said, "Hey, does anyone know how to get in contact with the con event organizer? Because nobody who won the cosplay contest has gotten any of their money. Obviously, they're not getting any of their money." And you know, I would have been so teed off if I had actually yeah. had the best costume and won that competition, and then they stiffed me on the bill. I would have been pretty PO'd. Mm -hmm. So our episode today is about the awesome Netflix original series Daredevil, which everyone should get a Netflix subscription and watch immediately. Or steal it off a friend. Or steal it off a friend. But just so you're in the cultural know, because this show is going to be in the cultural know. It's important. It's important. So here we are in uh, back in the Prius podcasting about daredevil having a great time enjoy so on april 10th netflix decided to change the game they have teamed up with marvel and disney to create original programming not some show like lily hammer that no one really asked for oh my god what? It's true. That show just like, it's like, oh, you want The Sopranos and you want comedy? This is the show for you. But no one asked for that. No one People was looking like for Lily Hammer. People like mob shows. People like mob shows. It's true. And I'll give Lily Hammer a try one day, so, I'm sure. So, uh, what, what's cracking me up right now is that you think that all of uh, Netflix's other original content is just like some stuff that they threw in the air. 
and said, maybe you don't think they do any sort of demographic. That's the whole reason they create their shows is because they go off of what people are putting in their queues. So literally some guys got like too much, enough people had funny and then mob and they were like, we, we got to make a funny mob movie. And then enough people had political thrillers made House of Cards. Enough people had prison movies, lesbians. I'm not saying Netflix <laughs> isn't smart. <laughs> I'm just saying that this is the first show that people had a name to ask for to want to watch. Yeah, well, okay. You know what I mean? This is the first, like, they've done Inspector Gadget. Sure, people want Inspector Gadget. I think this is the first show. special. This may be the first show they've done that doesn't directly come from content, like, based off of their... If I if I'm led to believe correctly, that doesn't come from them creating content based on their viewing, like, in research that they do. You know what I mean? Like they do extent they have extensive you know mining of people's data, and that's how they create a lot of their content. Orange is the New Black and all these shows on there. So I think Daredevil is like the first show that they were like outside of that. You know what I mean? They went okay. People on the outside love Marvel. I don't know how popular Marvel is on Netflix. Probably pretty popular. I think it's pretty popular. Everything but, I see with Marvel usually has five stars on Netflix. Yeah, but I mean, but my point is, is that they took the risk. You know what I mean? I think it's, I don't know. So we mentioned the name. <laughs> it is Daredevil, the Netflix original TV series brought to you by Marvel Studios. And if you were going to make like a demographic assessment of what they probably did to figure out like... We need to put a Daredevil show on TV. Uh, I think the demographic would be like everyone likes Marvel things, and people like Batman. Boys. So make a Shadows. Marvel Batman. What's the closest to a Marvel <laughs> Batman we have? And it's Daredevil. Yeah, true. But it's um, not fair to call Daredevil Batman. He's not Batman. He's not Batman. He's got the but, feel. He's got the noir feel of Batman, but he's not Batman. No, no one is Batman. <laughs> No blind man could be Batman. I'm just saying that, like, Batman... I, th- I think what's nice about Daredevil is that he has his own... Yes, his story is dark, and you can immediately bring in comparisons, but he's got his own unique identity. You know what I mean? And it's tied to a specific place. It's tied to his specific identity, being a blind lawyer. and You know what I mean? It, it, I, and, and his story isn't some... Tr- it, like, his story is a tragedy... You know, but it's a tragedy that was born of like human human failure and you know, kind of a mistake that his father made to do right by him. Yeah, it's less uh it's less just random violence affecting someone and more, you know, kind of a concentrated like lesson for him to kinda I think the lesson ultimately because he does have random things that happen to him, I think the lesson ultimately is uh like are you the product of your like a nature versus nurture? Are you the product of your environment, okay. sort of thing, and trying to break out of that? Because uh, Wilson Fisk and his Batlin Jack Murdoch are definitely products of their environment, the time that they spent in Hell's Kitchen. I think Matt is too. He just chose to go a different way, you know. Yeah, but he's obviously traveled a little bit. He's gained enough perspective that he can do some stuff. So, Daredevil. We're, like, out of order. There are 13 episodes, and they are all very, very good to great. Um, Excellent TV, excellent dialogue, excellent, like, plotting. Uh, Like, I cannot flaw them, find any flaws in their structure or their... Well, I'm sure we orchestration. Tried, but... If we tried, but why would you want to try to put uh, holes in the thing that you are enjoying so much? That would just be masochistic. That's the cri- that's what critical analysis is, man. But the Wunder Blog's not about critical analysis. Oh, I see. We're about fan love. We're about reactionary love. Yes, reactionary fan love from like five seconds after you saw it, and you're still on like the high of watching it. It's got. It's. I'll say like it's definitely. It is really beautifully shot and filmed. Some really creative, awesome, cinematic use of the camera work and the way that they set up shots and stuff. There's, um, I'm sure that, you know, this isn't even really a spoiler. There's been articles all over the place about a particular fight scene in one episode. 
that early was, on episode early, two. Yeah, but that was actually a one shot, uh, one take, uh, hallway close close um, quarters fight scene that I knew. Watch, I was like, this looks like it was in one take. Like this is really cool, and and it was, and it's really impressive that they. And apparently, they actually only had like four days to figure out how to do that. Whereas they said, you know, a movie might have a weeks to perfect the shot. Yeah, yeah. We had four days to do this, and um, he said he was very, the the stunt coordinator was very impressed with the New York stunt community. So go you, New York stunt community, for coming together and making Daredevil so cool. The 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 series is shot totally in New York, and it shows everything looks really authentic and. You feel like you're really in Hell's Kitchen in New York. They make uh, some, well, some some sort of like comments so that they could explain the. Yeah, because if you don't, I was actually talking to one of my coworkers and he's watching Daredevil and I and he didn't know about the history of Hell's Kitchen and so he was more impressed when I told him about it because you know if you are familiar with New York. Hell's Kitchen as it exists now is not what the Hell's Kitchen of Daredevil used to be. Hell's Kitchen is extremely gentrified. They try to they try to um, when they end up you know cleaning it up quote unquote they try to change the name they try to rebrand it as Clinton you know because that's its its more official name but obviously people don't like you know they still call it Hell's Kitchen because it was a it was a, a big place for Irish immigrants. And it was a very rough, rough, rough neighborhood. And now it's very gentrified. So I do, I think it was very interesting. I think in the first couple episodes, they had to explain. And they did, which which I think was very, um, it was really cool that they did that. Because I think it is a nod to the to intelligence. You know what I mean? Like, it's a nod to the intelligence of the viewers. If you know about the history of New York, you know about gentrification going on in New York right now, and you know about Hell's Kitchen, you're going to sit there and go, how the hell does this frigging guy with no money afford this building space? How does he afford this nice apartment? And they they do their best to kind of justify it. And anyway, so they do their, they really do their audience, you know, service and actually explain like, okay in case you're, you know, because everyone, like in, like, Friends, everyone was like, how the hell can they afford that apartment? It was rent-controlled, they eventually explained. But it's kind of like, yeah, so it's like, they, um, they had to explain how he can exist in this new sort of health kitchen. Now, it's funny because they stay away from the more fancy, like, parts of health kitchen, like the more gentrified, fancy restaurants and pubs, and they, um... Well, in some parts and in some shots, and they focus on the more on the on the alleyways that are still dark and still run down and tenement homes that still exist because they do still exist, just not in the capacity that they used to. And um, and it's it's I think it's an interesting thing that they had they still wanted to work with Hell's Kitchen. I mean, well, you can't you can't not work with Hell's Kitchen in Daredevil. I mean, it's so much a part of his identity. And even I, in the the Ben Affleck movie, they couldn't yeah, get away from they New York. Get away from New York. It's not a Punisher Boston. situation where you can just like be like, "Oh, he's from Tampa." Yeah, you know, <laughs> he's from the mean streets of Tampa. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like he. It, New York is New York is a part. Of, it's just like Spider Man. New York is a part of his soul. You can't take him out of New York. And um, I think that they did a really great job to incorporate the new Hell's Kitchen with the old. Um, they, they touch on gentrification, like actually Wilson Fisk, one of his goals is to... Wait, it's a spoiler. It's not that big of a spoiler. It is a spoiler. It's a you little spoiler. You gotta sing spoiler. the spoiler song. You gotta do stuff. Okay, fine. Sing the spoiler song. Okay, so now we recommend you go watch the show. Check it out. Yeah. If you don't want spoilers, check it. You know, you can listen to this next part. Spoilers, spoilers. <laughs> these are the spoilers. Spoilers! We do everything so randomly. Anyway. No, we don't. Oh! I don't think this is a big of a spoiler, but Wilson, one of Wilson Fisk's goals is to build up Hell's Kitchen, and it touches on that's ways a big and rent deal because that's like that's that it's like the opposite of what you'd imagine his character would want. You yeah. know, it's like they really did like a one eighty on Wilson Fisk, where we're used to seeing Wilson Fisk as like he wants to be this crime boss, he wants a secret cachet of power over people. 
he wants to really run everything without anyone knowing that well, he's he the man tries behind in the beginning. it. Yeah. But he ultimately has to reveal himself to the public to get one step ahead. See, that's the thing. I think they Murdoch. made him a. I think they made him a corporate enemy. I think in our modern age, babe, your alarm is going off like every fifteen seconds. I don't know why. <laughs> the I think the alarm in, cast. Yes, I think in our corporate age now, we believe the enemy is our big giant scary corporations. We want to believe that you know it's maybe it's possible that there's. Some big guy who's, who's pretending to be a philanthropist, but really is trying to wipe us all clean off the face of the earth. So he is can that what Bill Gates is doing with his fifty million? With his not fifty million, his fifty, 50 billion. billion. He's secretly the kingpin. He's secretly the kingpin. Mm-hmm. All those sweaters reveal don't reveal his inner evil. Get me the most unevil sweater, <laughs> please. <laughs> I don't know why Mr. Gates keeps on asking for not evil things. <laughs> <laughs> Get me an unevil latte. I Does anyone questions. find this suspicious? <laughs> Do these glasses make me look more evil or less evil? Kill that man with money, please. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's just... I think it's cool that they made him... I think to bring a modern kingpin, you gotta have him wanna be the big boss of the universe... You know what I mean? The only detail I thought was missing from, like, the Kingpin, like, uh, origin story plot was I wanted Kingpin, since he's, like, trying to sort of be heroic in the TV show, I wanted him to have, like, a hero that he identified with. Like, if he had been, like, a big Captain America, like, collector or fan or something... I think that would have been, like, a cool tie to the Marvel Universe, and it would have given, would like, not be a, fan of a Captain deeper America. insight. No, he wouldn't be a fan of Captain America. He'd be America. a fan of Loki. Of Loki? Because yeah. of mischief. Rebuilding a better tomorrow. Rebuilding a better tomorrow. It's true. Mass so Jensen. tyrannical. Yes, they are tyrannical. That's the whole point. Anyway, so... 13 episodes is definitely enough to set up... It's, it's a bit of an origin story, but not completely we're not coming in from the beginning when he hasn't started being daredevil uh, we do come in pre red costume though much to steven's chagrin well since we're in the spoiler section he doesn't get his signature horns and like combat armor outfit until the last 15 minutes of the 13th episode so if you're waiting for that you will be disappointed you will be you... waiting the whole time yeah exactly but, but it's worth it. When it comes out, it's really cool, and, you know, you just imagine how much, you know, how much they're going to kick things up to another level if they get a season two, the if they will was, get a season two. Yeah, the suit was very, uh, very well made. It looked like armor, but it also looked fluid, like you could move in it, and the the horns were really neat. They, they did a great job with the, with the costume. I don't know if it has the double D emblem on it. I didn't notice I it. I don't think it does. But I don't think it has that yet. But maybe it'll it'll pick it up eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, his black ninja prototype outfit is still pretty cool. And I'm expecting to see, like, hundreds of people cosplaying it now. Yes, I do. I Because it's so, it. like, simple. It is. I mean, they're going to have to find a way to not be blind. Because, you know, it's like covers your whole face, the top. But, so, this is kind of an origin story, but not totally an origin story, because when we come in, Matt is already starting his his crusade. mission, his crusade. Um, we get a lot of flashbacks, but the flashbacks all have purpose and use. They're not just throwaway flashbacks. Um, they ex- they kind of explain, you know, his father's tragic, you know, his, his father's death, and then they explain his training, and they explain, you know, kind of what happened to him and what influenced him to become... The person he is also for Wilson Fisk. I think the greatest part of this show was the constant juxtaposition between Wilson Fisk and Matt Murdock, and how both of these people have come from the same place, and they've both experienced the death of a father, but in totally different ways. Yeah, and then they both have visions for the city and even in the show they reference you know people refer they talk to Matt they're like you know are you sure you don't think what if you're just like him 
and you just don't know it. You know what I mean? You sound like Fisk at some points because they both talk about a vision to make a better city, a better Hell's Kitchen, but obviously they're going about it, again, in two totally different ways. But sometimes it intersects, and there's a moral dilemma for Matt to kind of go, well, at some point, do I need to kill Wilson Fisk? Because at, at the height of Wilson Fisk's evil in the show, he's re- he's a really imposing figure, extremely intimidating. Vincent D'Onofrio did such a good job. I mean, he always does a good job, but... I felt like every time he spoke, there was just this restrained rage in everything that he did. Like, at any moment, he was just going to explode and tear someone's head off, you know? And it's just, like, the way he he spoke with this, like, stilted, like, like he had to choke words out. Like, because he'd just rather be punching things. <laughs> like, it's... Like <laughs> I saw some, compl- some people complaining online that they made Wilson Fisk a metrosexual... That he's too oh effeminate. God. Oh my god! I don't know why. And I feel like they just totally missed the point of having like they missed of, everything of having like a hidden demeanor under his regular. Demeanor. First, okay. First of all, in regards to that, I do not think that is a valid criticism. In that, I think that anybody who, in this day and age, runs it on going, he's too effeminate. He's too this. He wears nice suits. That means that he's like a puff or whatever the hell. Other arrogant well, he's of crap, into crap they're saying. He's into art and wa- fancy wine is their argument. And that is into... not an argument. That is bullshit. I'm so- whoever said that you are an immature little idiot. I I can't. Stephen, I can't take that seriously. Really? Someone with money? First of all, he's not into wine. His best friend slash henchman Wesley has to tell him what to drink. Second of all, he's not into art. He's into... He buys the painting that reminds of a disturbed childhood. Exactly. He literally buys something to remind him of of a tragic and disturbing moment in his life. In what way he's not going out and buying a Picasso? Like he's buying literally paint splash. Hey, by the way, good job for modern art. <laughs> yeah, you know she because she's like all that matter. Uh, Vanessa, which is uh, Wilson Fisk's love interest, uh, you know she says all that matters about art is how it makes you feel, and then he's looking at a bunch of splotches of paint. Now, in my opinion, to me, it's a bunch of splotches of paint. But to this guy, it's like, oh my god, this is this is important, you know. So good on modern art for uh, getting a kick in there. I guess some people are getting looking at some people are looking at splotches of paint and going, I feel so many things. <laughs> That's just yeah, no. But anyway, I would just feel longing for the loss of my money. Yeah, everything that he does has purpose. It's none of it is just. Everything about him is so carefully crafted. It's ridiculous and immature to discredit all of that by saying he's effeminate and a metrosexual. Even if he was effeminate, who gives a shit? I'm sorry, I just that's just me and my my I don't care because it's not a big fucking deal. But my point is, I do not think these choices were made to make him look fancy with a pinky finger. Everything he did was to construct a persona. And all this persona is doing is hiding this carefully crafted like rage and anger and like just violence in him i I think none of that was careful he wears suits made of frigging body armor he like I, i you know what i think and this is my opinion and this is the truth i think they think he's effeminate because he fell in love with that with vanessa i think they think she makes him look bad yeah I do. I think that's what it is. They don't like her. They don't like her character. So he, the way that they wanted the Kingpin to be written to was be just alone. He wakes up with yes. like four hot chicks yes. in his bedroom. Yes. Then he pays them all yes. off. Yes. And then he goes yes. about his evil empire. They wanted to. They wanted him to be like a. Eh. First of all, mob bosses like that don't exist. Do they? Ex- Please tell me if they exist anymore. They don't exist like that. We don't have big mafioso, macho Italian mobsters anymore. We really don't. Not like it used to be. We. That's one of the reasons they had to change his story. He can't be the big, 
um the big guy like with the stuff and then the health kitchen and I'm so You're bad. You're missing Danielle's beautiful dance. Dance of, of this Italian stuff. mobster, like yeah, my <laughs> Italian mobster dance. He can't be that guy anymore. It's not realistic into into our world. Just like they had to incorporate the gentrification of Hell's Kitchen into the show, they have to incorporate what the frig are we gonna do with Wilson Fisk? He can't be this mob guy. Mob guys don't really exist like that anymore. If they do exist, they're in the shadows, just like Fisk. You know what I mean? They're not. They're not. They're not high. They're not big. They're not sitting in a, a restaurant. They're not Carmine Falcone. You know what I mean? It's. It's. They're not that. It doesn't make sense. And so they're not hanging out with cops in Italian restaurants, exactly. giving them their bribes. It, that's not how this works anymore. And so it's just kind of like I think that they did a brilliant job of incorporating that. And and I think they had to give him a human story. So that there are times where you're almost going, man, I kind of feel bad for Wilson Fisk until you realize that he's a horrible, sadistic murderer. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like he's got such a tragic background. You, you kind of, he's kind of justified in what he did to his dad. I would, I, I would have. Yeah. It might have broken me. Yeah, I might have done it. We can agree with that. You but, know what I mean? So the I think. The next step, you know, was, you know, taking apart the body and then. Well, that was his Hiding mom. your life and. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's him. But obviously what he, he broke, you know what I mean? And he kind of. And the little boy they get to play, young Wilson Fisk, was so good. Yeah, he was. All the actors on the show were fantastic. Were excellent, yeah. With a special nod going, a special Wunderblog award going to the actor who played Wesley, henchman extraordinaire. Yes, was Toby Leonard Moore, I think was his name. Oh my gosh, if I remember that right. Well, if you remember that right. I'm a genius. Yeah, so genius yeah. points. He, Wesley was a fantastic henchman. I kind of wish that he didn't die, but I know that he was really, really evil. I like the structure of these seasons like this. I like that we're kind of going into the British TV structure. Like, if you watch European television, British TV, Australian TV, and stuff like that, they tend to do small seasons. Um, short seasons with long episodes, you know, six episodes, 12 episodes mm -hmm. that are very episodic. Um, and I like that we're going into that structure because I think sometimes the 22 episode season run can, if a TV show doesn't have a, a focus, it can drag it along and you can kind of have filler, which is why, you know, things like serials like Law and Order and stuff do so well in that 22 episode season because they don't really have a main storyline mm -hmm. going out through the entire show. They have one, they have one. You know, they have a, an epi every every episode is a new case. They solve the case and then they move on. But I think for stuff like this, I think it really benefits to have a, an end goal and a purpose and a, an end time. You know, it used to be that we would just want a TV show to go on as long as possible. But now I think we get excited when we know, okay, this is going to be four seasons, 20 episodes a season. You know what I mean? I think I think it I think it helps us to know that. I don't know. I feel like maybe it's just because I was younger, but when I was younger, you know, the way TV was is like you just kept going and going, and how many seasons you could get. I'm trying to milk you it know, as long as you can. You didn't, but now I think people kind of see the benefit of knowing when the end game is coming. You know. And who's responsible for this? Lost. True. Because everyone was like, "When is Lost going to end?" And Lost was like, "Oh, we're going to firmly put an end That's date true. on it. That way we can." complete our story you're and right the I think story you're right. of lost. lost definitely brought I think lost definitely started that trend to 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 the benefit of to the benefit of everybody because yeah exactly it's like when a show doesn't have a purpose or when a show doesn't know what it's going to end and it's trying to drag out a big plot point and it doesn't know what else to do it can start creating filler and filler can be very boring and take away from you know the overall, the greatness. overall greatness of the show. So I think that this structure really helped Daredevil. I think binge watching helps Daredevil. Well, it just it just helps me. It's fun to do. But it lends itself to binge watching. You know, every yeah. end, every episode ends with some sort of hook to get you in, to get you to click the next. Keep watching. Um, big 
big uh, big props to the Mighty Duck Kid, Foggy Nelson. Mm-hmm. He was awesome on the show. Very relatable. Very sweet. Big up to Deborah Ann Wool, who was Karen Page. If you forgotten where she's from, she was Jessica on True Blood. Of course. Well, True Blood. True Blood ended on such a horrible, sour note that I think we won't forget that it exists. It's a dark show. It's not really appropriate for your younger children. No, yeah. Until they're older. <laughs> There's like a lot of <laughs> stuff that could cause some nightmares. Like human trafficking. There's a lot of bones breaking, um, a lot of impalings and stabbings. It's not a it's not a kid show. Head squishings. It's, it's very violent. Um, they don't. It's not. It's graphic, but it's not overly graphic. But it's still graphic enough that you're like. Ugh. It's not The Walking Dead, but it's. It's not Agents. It's in the shields. same. Yeah, it's in Agents. <laughs> So they're not using sleeper rounds to knock people out. <laughs> no, no, no. They took a. I think they took a really interesting risk to make this very mature. Um, I think it's cool. It's exciting. It is exciting to lend to lend something to, to this. see this shadowy yeah. part of the Marvel universe for the first time. Yeah, it's really exciting. Done and, well and. What bothers me the most out of this, Daredevil being so good, is that I don't want to see the Jessica Jones show now unless Daredevil's in it a lot. And the Luke Cage show, I just want to see Daredevil in a Daredevil outfit now. They, like, got me so primed for Daredevil. Well, he might be an Iron Fist. He might be. He's probably going to do a cameo on each show, I imagine. Just so they can have that, like... Brand name superhero. Well, I think the future questions are: Are they going to put Daredevil in Civil War? That would be. It has. To, I mean, he does have a small part to play in Civil War, doesn't he? He's in the Resistance, I believe, with Captain yeah. America in the I original mean, comic. That's kind of the interesting thing to me: Are they going to take these people who are, you know, we have the TV shows that are running on the major network? We've got Agents of Shield. Um, Agent Carter. Agent Carter, well, you know, that was a one-off. I don't know if they're going to have another season. And they're talking about doing another Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. spinoff, but they won't tell us anything about it at all. Yeah. So, you know, they have the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., then they have, which already has incorporated itself into the movies. They have, now they have these four shows coming up on Netflix, a.k.a. Jessica Jones, Daredevil, Luke Cage, and The Iron Fist. Are Is this all going to, are these people going to end up in the movie? I think that's really exciting. I think that's I think that's such an exciting and unique thing to do to literally have crossovers between the television media and cinematic media. And I think that ushers in a new era of of we can of you know you don't these things don't have to be mutually exclusive. They can be you know they can be intertwined. The relationship can be intertwined. Especially since there's so much opportunity with media to watch it in so many different variations now. You know what I mean? In the day when you had to go home at 8 o'clock and sit down and watch a television show, there's no way you could have this, this kind, kind of, of crossover. It just wouldn't make sense. You know what I mean? But now, you can literally watch the episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. before Captain America Winter Soldier in the movie theater and then when the movie starts, watch Captain America Winter Soldier and, you know what I mean, and get the background. I think that's really cool. It is really cool. I don't yeah. disagree. There's, I don't know there's what else to say, but it's really cool. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> it's really cool. Synergy is cool. So, watch Daredevil. Check it out on Netflix. Support it in whatever way is humanly possible at the time. Make them bring Wesley back from the dead. No. Wesley. Well, if he does, he has to come back as like a cyborg or something really cool. <laughs> cyborg Wesley. A cyborg Wesley. Or it's like a digital clone or something. <laughs> Hologram Wesley. Hollow, Hollow Wesley. There we go. Uh, so that was us talking about Daredevil and just a couple things that uh, that we didn't get to express to the fullest uh, in the car ride. Daredevil himself, Charlie Cox, is amazing. He manages to capture Matt Murdock's sexual charisma 
as well as his uh his like uh good heartedness as well as his like brooding darkness he plays a lot of different uh you know shades of Matt Murdock and they all work really well and he does it half the time staring into blank space and or behind you know sunglasses yes it's an impressive performance. Charlie it, Cox is very impressive. And I can't wait to see him stand side by side with Robert Downey Jr. and Chris Hemsworth and Chris Evans and in the Avengers Infinity War, hypothetically. We can all pray that that will happen. Or maybe even sooner in Civil War if if there is, if Kevin Feige is good to us. Mm-hmm. Or Feige. I think it's pronounced Feige. Is it Feige? I think I've, I've seen him announced as Feige. Okay. I'm going to go Feige. If I'm wrong, then, you know, strike me down with me owner's hammer. Any, uh, any, anything about Daredevil you want to just highlight? Uh, any Charlie part? Cox is, for the ladies, Charlie Cox is very easy on the eyes, guys. If you, you may remember him from such films as Stardust, uh, he played the adorable Tristan Thorne. Oh my God, I can't remember his name. Whoa. And he was very cute and good in that show, but now he's even cuter. And I say go and watch it for the ladies. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Vundacast. I have been your host, the man here in Sector 2814, podcasting for the people, Stephen. And with me today, the chatty and yes, charming uh-huh. and damn out of CH words. Ch- ch- Me, chill, Danielle. You, Danielle. And remember, kids, if you're innocent and you're convicted of a crime, there's only one law firm that can represent you Nelson and Murdoch. If you're in New York. If not, then you're kind of screwed. Yeah, totally. Hey, Alvanda. Hey, Alvanda. Wundercast? Give yeah. it up for Wundercast, man. What an adorable name. You're listening to the Voonda Cost. What's up, everybody? This is Jason David Frank, Green Ranger. You're listening to Voonda Cast. Subscribe to the Vondacast.